All right. Well, hello, everyone. I am Kyle Chambers with Quality Matters. We are here for another Business Visionaries Book Club. This week, we have Catherine Brown here uh, with her book. If you have not purchased, make sure to go ahead and get How Good Humans Sell. So this is a first for us. So we actually had the author of the book on. So this is exciting. So Catherine, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, uh, kind of a little bit about what inspired you to write the book. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you so much for having me. So I, my name is Catherine Brown and um, I have met Steve a couple years ago now. So I'm so delighted to be included. Thank you for having me be the first author. I have been in sales for over 20 years, okay. actually over 25 years, <laughs> B2B, <laughs> B2B sales, if I'm being truthful. And, and what's funny is when you first start in your career, the things that you think are the reasons you struggle, um, you think you'll outgrow those or that um, or that maybe you didn't diagnose that correctly first. And what I found after 25 years is that some of the very same things that were a challenge for me and a challenge for my colleagues continue to be a challenge for all salespeople. And that is that people deep down worry that selling is um, pushy, mm -hmm. that people will perceive what you could frame as persistent action as um, aggressive. No, never, <laughs> never heard these and, things. And, 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 and my observation is that we overcorrect. We under ask and overcorrect because of this concern. So fear drives a lot of our behavior. And what I wanted to do with How Good Humans Sell was help people reconcile and understand they have freedom in what they make their own behavior and their action and how they interpret other people's behavior, they have agency over those things. They have okay. freedom over those things. And I want people to feel free and to enjoy this profession. I like it. You know, I, this is something I've talked about a number of times before, probably talk about another hundred times again, is when I started Texas Quality Assurance, my intent was that I was not going to be the CEO and I was not going to be the sales guy. I wanted to be the operations guy. I wanted to do the training. I wanted to work with the folks on the production side of things. And, you know, God has a funny sense of humor. So here I am as the CEO, as the, the sales manager, as the guy doing all of that. And so I'm having to learn a lot of these concepts the very, very hard way. Yeah. You know, this is book, not just for salespeople, though, because, yes, we are all always selling. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, we want to work with people who we trust and mm -hmm. we want to be people of our word and have integrity. And and so this book talks about those sort of things. And mm -hmm. a lot of business sales books talk about the sales process, which mm -hmm. you definitely mm -hmm. go into really mm -hmm. well. But all that means nothing <laughs> if you don't really believe in what you sell yeah. and believe in yourself. Yeah. And, and if you won't do it, right? Like you have to do the steps. And mm -hmm. so understanding and having some tools to say, what's holding me back? Why am I not doing what I actually have been taught to do? Um, I was so pleased, Steve, because recently um, a gentleman who runs a nonprofit read it and did a review for me. And then I had an event that was for trade associations. And of course, the trade associations, they do sell sponsorships and want those partnerships, but they also are looking for how to think about recruiting more members and what is the value to members of those trade associations. And they felt like there were useful principles in that. So that made me really happy that there was a wide application possible. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'll just say this because I have, you know, of course, the, the weird quality management background. Right. And so what I love the most is <laughs> you open the book to a glossary of terms. <laughs> like I harp on folks all the time. We're writing procedures. We're writing manuals like dad gummit. Put what you mean by all of this jargon in the front. Oh, that was so helpful. Well, I'll tell you, uh, shout out, shout out to my editor and one of my um, one of my helpers in the process. I actually used a ghostwriter to get me started. And I don't mind telling people that because this idea would just be um, in my head mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have come to life. And we did some audio interviews. And after the audio interviews, she suggested a table of contents and she put the glossary. And I said, first of all, shouldn't it be in the back? Should it really be in the front? She said, nope, put it in the front. And I yep. said, do you think we really need it? And she said, are you kidding people? And she's done sales. So she said, people have all different kinds of definitions yep. for these words. You really need to say, here's what I mean. And you don't have to agree <laughs> with me, but henceforth through the book, here's what I mean. Yeah. And that totally is a shout out to her because that was her <laughs> suggestion. And I have, and I, I'm so glad we did too. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I love it. Cause I go through it and like, okay, well, what does she actually mean? As we go through this, cause you, you're right. People have so many different ideas and preconceptions about what these words mean. And you would think it's a word. It just has a meaning. Right. 
Not true. Exactly. You know, Kyle, what the biggest one is that comes up every client I ever work with, anytime I ever teach or, or sell, and you probably see this too, Steve, it's just what does a lead mean, right? <laughs> so a lead to some people means um, quite qualified. And it when you say lead, they mean it's kind of implied that it's very warm. And that's not the way I learned to use leads. Leads could be names on a list that you purchase. Um, they're not qualified and you certainly haven't spoken to them. That's my definition. But I again, I'm not saying that's the right definition, but it's very important when think about if marketing and sales are arguing over lead quality, it would be critical that you had the same definition. Yeah. You know. No, totally, totally agree. We, we've got a uh, a contract with a, a company to help us find because we sell software, uh, part of what we do, and so we've got a contract with a company to uh, help us find good so leads for selling software. And so we've had a real recent come to Jesus meeting <laughs> yes. um, because the leads we were getting were absolute complete subpar. It, it was really terrible process. Yeah. And so we spent the better part of a week going back and forth, and I'm trying to coach and train their people. And look, this is what, and guess what I did. This is what all of these terms mean. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. So, like these, these are all the terms we're talking about. So, while your folks are doing the interviews, they really need a keen ear mm -hmm. to listen for this, or they don't know where to push the lead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You probably wanted qualified prospects. Oh yeah, right. I'm making a phone call. And it's just all sorts all over the place. Yeah. I'm like, I've got a better shot cold calling than doing this. Yes. 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 So. Yeah. Steve, you come at this from a little bit of a, a different perspective. So, you know, this is one of the things I kind of want to do with these book clubs is um, I know I hate jumping into a book just to get halfway in and go, this is a waste of time. So obviously we can see from a, if you're in sales, yeah. this is an act of, you know, very useful. But for coming from a not so sales oriented position, what are some things of value you find in here? Well, I for me, I learned a lot of bad habits being in oil and gas mm. for the last 20 years. <laughs> and you allude to some of these the mm. old school ways of mm. selling. Mm. Like what? And where you want to establish trust first and then by you know, a lot of times taking guys out to – this is what we did. Take guys out golfing, take guys to ball games. That's to build the trust and then you can solve their problems. I think now things have flipped. Mm -hmm. where you now need to be a problem solver mm -hmm. in whatever you do, mm -hmm. not just right. sales. And that establishes the trust in mm -hmm. relationship. Do, yeah. do you mm -hmm. see the same thing? I do. And I, it's not really the full scope of the book, but I do love at every chance I get to talk about what the internet has done for what's required for us in marketing. And so part of how we build trust is great content. It's that people expect to be given a fair bit away. You all are doing that, right? You're bringing value to people mm -hmm. who serve you. And um, I seek to do that. And people want to do a lot of their own homework and they want to be pretty ready by the time you talk. And so we just, we just don't need to do some of the steps we used to do because anyone who's remotely interested will have at, at the very least checked our LinkedIn profile, seen if we have a YouTube channel. They've done their, a little bit of their own research. Mm -hmm. So that coordination with sales and marketing has to be even tighter mm -hmm. and much more user friendly for the buyer. Yeah, I think. No, I, I agree. You know, it's um, the whole reason we started the podcast here is because I hate selling to people. I it it you you hit it all over the place and you're it feels sleazy it yeah. feels pushy yeah. and so I'm like okay well I'm just gonna start the podcast and we're just gonna talk about quality we're gonna talk about everyday things we're gonna talk about you know industry specific things but we're gonna look at everything through this quality management lens and hopefully we'll become to be known as you know, somewhat of an expert mm -hmm. in the field mm -hmm. and it's it's really weird it's like several folks we're talking to right now. We're already podcast listeners before I ever made that first cold call. Yes. And so like, hey, you have a podcast, don't you? Like, yeah, yeah, I do. Like, oh, I already listened to you. It just makes the whole process so much more natural. That's so great. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the sales process has changed also. Like you said, we, we used to sell a lot of technical products and services, which were really difficult to, mm -hmm. to explain. So we would have these meetings with clients and we would just be all technical all right. the time. An hour long meeting, the entire hour is just engineer talking about the technical specs, mm -hmm. not even letting the client speak. Like they don't even allow for a, taking a breath so that they can right. just speak the whole way. And what they don't understand is that if you're really going to make a sale, it's gotta be 
you got to find that compelling reason for change, find that emotional need. Yes. And you talk a lot about the emotional side of making decisions. Exactly. I don't think that this part's in the scope of the book, but you know, when I do a discovery call, which is what I call that first 20 minute call, really my two goals, if you refer to, um, I think it's in chapter six with the magic topics, uh, the five magic topics. But when I, when, what I'm saying with this idea is because I'm saying, let me find the page for our readers if they're looking at it later. <laughs> so on page 95, uh, what I'm saying is that if you sell anything business to business, that you have to ask about goals at some point. You have to understand timing. You have to make sure you're talking to decision maker. And I give a lot of flexibility about how you get that information. But I say, if you go, if you do a proposal and you jump through a bunch of hoops and you don't know this information yet, it's not qualified. You're, you're not guaranteed Absolutely. to close yes. it. <laughs> my, my biggest thing, um, just to piggyback on what you said a minute ago, is that the first thing I want to understand is goals. And the second is, is it a marketing lead or is it a sales lead? And that has to do with timing. Yeah. Right. And so that's, again, why we go back to that issue of good marketing is that it's totally okay if they're not ready. They can listen to your podcast. They mm -hmm. can follow your email marketing. Yeah. You can, you, you could give them a referral to someone else who is the right next thing for them. Mm -hmm. In my case, it would be if somebody wanted sales training, but they didn't have a website yet, they need to get that in place before we do sales training because I want them to use the tool mm -hmm. of the site in the sales process. So if they came to me first, I would say, great, the first step is for you to do this. Let me give you a referral. And I would know for me right now, that was still a marketing lead. Nice. Right? Yeah. So those two things, those are the two of the magic topics that I think for me, they come first. Somebody else might have another way of doing it, but I'm trying to vet on urgency. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask, they won't tell you. Sure. A lot yeah. of times. Yeah. No, right. I mean, it, especially like uh, we do a lot with uh, the consultation. I think, Steve, I'm sure it's going to be really similar for you is you start talking to someone. They know that they have a need for it. But the truth is they may be two or three years away in their business from utilizing what you have. And so I have uh, in previous, you know, uh, life doing uh, the IT management. In mm -hmm. case, um, I'd start talking to someone. And as soon as they realize that I'm not a candidate for a sale in the next 30 to 60 days, Boom, they're done with yes. me. There was nothing to do. They yes. had nothing helpful to give. Yes. And it's like, well, fine, screw you too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, um, I'd be interested in what you all think of this. I have had several conversations recently where it's been kind of stunning to me how long someone has followed me on LinkedIn without even giving a like. Yeah. Like, and I don't mean this word negative, but the word that comes to my mind is lurkers. Like, you know, like they like they follow and they and they appreciate and they seem to enjoy. But I actually like I don't know that they're I don't know they're doing that yeah. because think about LinkedIn. If they don't if they don't click on your profile, you don't have any way of knowing. I haven't even figured out with Sales Navigator how to know. I don't think you can know. So um, I had two different instances, one where a woman that I tried to sell to with a former company that I had and the timing wasn't right. She changed companies, kept following me. I didn't even know she changed companies. Seven years later, <laughs> seven years later, she contacted me. That's a recent one. They're a client now. And then another example that came up recently was I spoke at something for Houston Exponential three years ago. And somebody that went through that cohort came back and said, okay, we're kind of growing. And I think, you know, I think we're ready to have some conversations now. I had them as a first connection in LinkedIn. I saw when I went back and looked that they're in my email marketing, but we haven't talked for three years. Right. Three years. That's a long conversion time, but, <laughs> but it goes to show that this isn't a silver bullet. No. You know, especially with LinkedIn or any kind of digital marketing. These things take a long time to, mm -hmm. to cultivate those relationships. And I think you write in the book that, a no doesn't mean no forever. Right. It might just be a no, not right now. Yeah. And that's okay. Not and yet. that's fine. And, yeah. you know, this is one thing I've thought about a lot is now that we have literally everything on the internet, I mean, you can learn anything and everything. You know, I'm not saying that school's not important, college is important, but realistically, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and more that you'll learn in school and college is already out there for freaking free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because there's so much information available, kind of your point earlier, Steve, what you do these presentations, it was all the technicals because realistically, they had no other way to learn the information that you're presenting. That's right. No effective right. way, at least, to learn what you're presenting. And so that was the value that was brought to the table. Well, hell, now I could probably find, you know, a, a, a very simple um, YouTube explanation of the same concept. Y'all took two or three hours to present. So it, it's like we've gone backwards. I say backwards, but. It really is about treating people like people. Mm -hmm. Like you really have to treat people like people. That's how you get the sell. 
mm-hmm. um, you know, one of our, our recent uh, consulting uh, contracts. So they're talking to me just like, okay, so Kyle, really, your only role is to connect us with all of the other folks in your network who do what we need. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much it. I love yeah, that's that. pretty much it. I I, I'm just going to find all the folks you need for your project and I'll get them connected and we'll get the work done. And he's like, so your company hasn't actually doing a whole lot of the work. I said, no. No, I just know the right people that I need to connect you with. <laughs> but, you know, as I grow in influence, more people a- are asking me, like, what are you reading? Mm-hmm. Who do you follow? Mm-hmm. Who should I follow? Yes. Right. And I mean, I have people I admire that I ask them those very same questions. Right. Yeah. Like like being the being a filter for mm-hmm. people where we know we're like minded on certain things so I can trust you. That's a great way to build a brand. I think that was the genesis of this book club is Steve had posted his reading list on LinkedIn. And because I'm always interested in like, what other people read? What do you listen to? I mean, I've got God only knows how many books in the Audible, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, I really like that because I've been wanting to update my reading list. And I was like, Steve, we, we need to we need to do like a book review on this stuff. And so that was the whole genesis of this. I love that. I love that. I wanted to be a better reader and I can fall into that trap of working, um, you know, in your business instead of on your business. And Mm -hmm. I weirdly, Mm -hmm. even though I was home during the pandemic, didn't read very much. I just worked all the time. Um, I've started a new routine the last month or so that I've been making reading a priority first thing early Mm -hmm. because I'm tired at night and I just don't remember Mm -hmm. what I read or I read the same page a few times. And so (laughs) so I've made that an early morning coffee thing. And sometimes I have to set a timer because if I, if the book is good, I find myself really engrossed. I'm like, Oh yeah, this was supposed to just be for X pages or X minute. But um, I've read, I've abandoned two books halfway through that. I thought I got the gist and love it and finished two books in four weeks. That's pretty cool. Cause yeah. it's, cause yeah. it's like six days a week that I'm yeah. doing that. I mean, I, that is a new habit for me. I'm so happy yeah. to be cultivating that. We'll have to add some of these books to the list and have you yes. out again. I will yes. tell you, <laughs> I will tell you. Well, something I started doing recently, just you know, while we're on the topic is I realized that my calendar is just like spread everywhere. I've got random appointments all the time. So I really sat down to kind of organize my week. Like, you know, what hours of the day are supposed to be for what activities? I kind of thought about like my kids school schedule. Like they have an hour for this, they have an hour for this, yes. they have an hour for this. I'm like, okay, so I can't make everything fit as nice and neatly as their school schedule does. But I've got, you know, in the morning, I'm going to take 30 minutes. And like right now, I'm trying, my goal is to memorize Proverbs. Mm. So I'm going through every morning rereading Proverbs. All my, 31 Proverbs? I'm, I'm sorry? You're going to memorize all of them? That's my intent. That's awesome. Yeah. And so I'm reading through Proverbs for like the ninth time this year right now. That's awesome. And then so during the lunch break, because I rarely take like a traditional lunch. And so that's my like a noon to one thirty is lunch and learn on my uh, calendar. And so you. I get the little pop up to come up I'm like, OK, well, I've got an hour and a half here where that's all I need to do. I just need to read something, learn something new I didn't know yesterday. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, having some structure, at least a semblance of structure as a as a CEO or entrepreneur. Oh gosh. Helps a lot with just the nerves and it does the stress. And it's so easy to just let everything you have, like you're talking about, you're so busy during the quarantine. It's so easy to let all of these responsibilities and details we have just overflow and flood our lives. Okay. And then we find we have no time left for what actually matters. That's right. So I didn't used to do this, but um, as that pertains to sales, I started asking people sometimes before a training engagement, I've started asking their team for them to journal their time and, and log their time for a couple of weeks leading up to the engagement. I, like I wish I'd started it sooner. That's a good idea. I mean, it's it's really very telling because you see, first of all, they have a lot of internal meetings. Mm-hmm. Just the company has a lot of mm-hmm. internal meetings that they pull people into when, as I define it, you know, in the glossary, instead of doing revenue generating activities, they're, right. they're in meetings. And then they have a lot of time in every case that they don't know where it went. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the you, uh, scroll will kill us. It feels productive. Yeah. Yeah. And then you <laughs> see things that they call sort of general sales, but it's like research and, and, and social media and things that, um, I think can be useful, but are often used as a distraction when you don't actually want to do your follow up because you feel <laughs> nervous. I've never yes. done that. Yes. Never. You, you mentioned something early in the book called, um, sales call reluctance. Yeah. Yes. And, <laughs> I don't know why I do it still to this day. Yeah. Put it off. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I need to delete all my junk mail. You know, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, what can I do to stop doing that? Right. So I I found a couple techniques that are 
kind of both what I call inside the person and outside the person. Okay. So one of the things that helps me, I think I talk about the marbles in the book. Do, do I talk about the marbles? How I have a jar of marbles when, when I have good things happen? I don't think so. Okay. I, I thought I, I put remember. that in there, but I'll share it now. So when people talk about yeah, how can I build belief? How can I be less anxious? What could this look like? I talk about how they're I think it's important that you that on, when you think about the things outside yourself, we want as humans to have real evidence. We want real data. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just make stuff up. Right. Right. And when we especially when we're combating something that makes us feel nervous. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I do, which at the risk of sounding a little silly on your podcast, I'm going to tell all the listeners this works for me. OK, I have this. I bought these absolutely gorgeous marbles that are from not don't think like cheap Chinese checkers that you would get like the replacement marbles off Amazon. I'm talking about a marble glass blower. Okay. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. They need to be beautiful. And um, cause I think that's part of just sort of elevating the whole thought process. And every single time something happens that is outside evidence that someone has perceived value, that they have received value from something I've done. I put a marble in the jar. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have this giant, this giant box of marbles and every month I start over. Mm -hmm. So when I have to do my follow-up, which I do, I mean, I have pending sales opportunities right now that haven't yet closed that need different follow-ups. And when I feel any anxiety about that, I literally look over at the <laughs> August jar and I'm like, well, all those people think I'm awesome. Yeah. yeah. All those people thought I was helpful. And, right. and so you might say like what things get marbles? Well, five-star reviews, a referral to another client, mm -hmm. a thank you email, hearing a client closed a piece of work for me is so, so gratifying. So whatever that evidence would be for you, that is a real thing that is outside of your own head. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? It's, it's like confirmation. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. confirmation. It's real data. I'm married to a scientist. He always says <laughs> data. I want data. Right. And then there are all kinds of techniques that have to do that I draw heavily from the personal development community about um, you know, having affirmations and visualizing success and things that happen inside your mind. You know, there are techniques inside your mind that mm -hmm. you can do, but also it's reframing what selling is. And I do talk about that in the book. Oh yeah. Well, it's, this is one thing I, I've talked about before and, you know, R Rob, who's not here today and we need to shame him appropriately because, <laughs> you know, he, he didn't, uh, he didn't plan a schedule appropriately. Just shame, 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 he needs Rob. A time journal. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but is like I say selling, I'm not saying that I am uh, by any means where I want to be with it yet, but it really is putting it in a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'm a horrible introvert. Mm -hmm. I get absolutely drained by talking to people. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the uh, reluctance of making the sales calls. Oh my gosh, that is the, single most draining part of my day because mm. I just don't like dealing with people. Yes. We call and, them OPs in our family. Just <laughs> other people. Yes. <laughs> um, but there's still a lot of skill to all of these things. It, it can become like any other skill. You can learn it. You can get better at it. You can practice. I love the time journaling example. Mm. I mm. may wind up stealing that for, uh, especially when we're working with uh, safety managers. Mm. Oh my gosh, safety managers. They, they have the most weird constraints on their time, right? Mm. So they're pulled into every insurance meeting. They're pulled into every executive meeting. Mm. If there's an investor meeting, they're pulled into it. They're pulled into half their week is spent in meetings, not on actually working with the people. And so that's not a bad idea there to go through. Like, really, where am I actually spending my time? Because we all think we know. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually sit down and you start mapping out the number of minutes a day, like, I only mapped out three hours. And I was here for eight. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Just like everything. It's like you think you're you think you're making good food choices and then you start journaling it. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, I do eat oh, yeah. chips before dinner every night or yeah. whatever, you know, whatever the temptation is. Three pots of coffee, but there's no problem there. <laughs> if it's black, at least there's no calories. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the uh, light bulb moments for me here was when you talk about um, sales is you. It's no, a noble profession because you're helping people. And yes. That was one of the things I got into consulting was I really wanted to help people, but I never thought of it as I'm going to help people by helping them see this new product or service or this new right. company that can make their life easier, or make more money or reduce stress. And uh, so when you pose it like that, it all kind of clicked for me. Like mm -hmm. now I probably do a lot better when I make those calls. I don't feel like I'm bothering them. Right. I feel like I'm, I'm helping them. Right. That's great. And I also, I don't sell directly to them. I just start by saying, Hey, what are you guys working on? What's your challenges right now? Yeah. Exactly. Let's keep up at night. 
And then if I have a company that I'm helping um, w that has that kind of product or service, then we'll, I'll bring it up and see if there's something that's important to you yep. or interesting to you. Uh, never just call up and say, hey, guess what? I just want to gizmo <laughs> I want to sure. shove down your throat. Right. So, so. Sure. I think something too that happens, the, this is not as great of a tip if you are literally in your first sales job because you are still building your network. Mm -hmm. But those of us that have been in it for a while, as you collect relationships with other great people, I really feel like knowing that I have those potential referrals at my disposal has really changed my the way I approach sales calls because I can find out if I ask about their goals and I understand about timing back to that earlier mm -hmm. point about is it a marketing leader sales lead when they share about the goals if I'm not the person who's the right solution bringer to that within 15 minutes right I can decide who to introduce them to yep. and then to your point about being an aggregator and screener of people mm -hmm. right then then I make a referral it, I'm still being the guide, right. right? Chapter eight, right? I'm still being a guide, helping them on their way. And by the way, those referral partners love me yeah. because I am a good partner and I do think of people and I do make those connections easily. And so that makes me so much less nervous because I don't think the point of the sales call is for me to look for an angle to talk them into working with me. No. Right. I don't, I really don't think that like, I don't have enough information to even know if I would want to do that when we first get on the call. And that's not my goal anyway, but I still hear this. Like you hear people talk about that sales training is teaching people to close or mm -hmm. teaching people to always ask for the sale. And there are some things where, it's a useful skill, but it's only one piece of the toolbox. Right. And and, and I think there are a few industries where, um, like I was talking to somebody about this recently, if you sell something where the lead list changes every day and they're going to buy from you or the opportunity is going to go away or they're going to buy from you or they're going to buy from someone else. Like I know people that have like 48 hours to reach someone. And if they don't, they know that their probability of closing is extremely low. Right. That's different. Mm -hmm. But that is so, so the minority. Mm -hmm. of most of the situations that I encounter. It's usually much longer sales cycles and you have time to do things right. And you have time to be for them and not rush. And um, so, so those referral relationships have kind of changed things for me. That's, that's really opened up the way I can help. And it doesn't always lead back to me right away. Well, we, we, anytime we talk about sales, we always talk about, you know, you got to show value, but really what the, what the heck's that look like? It's kind of one of these other terms gets tossed around show value. So kind of a weird example. I may have shared this before, but um, I was supervisor for Best Buy when I was working through college. Right. And so we had a data backup solution. that was like $99. Now truth is we'd written a script that would go through and find all the word docs, Excel docs, pictures, videos, whatever, and just grab all those from the hard drive and, and copy them. So we literally just pushed a button at this point to do most of the backups. Um, and so one of my guys that was working with me, he was talking about how, you know, it's not worth $99. It's so easy for us. It's not worth that. You know, these are and he's feeling real bad for the customer. And, I understand that. I mean, you know, their computer crashed, they got their baby videos on there, they've got their wedding pictures, whatever it is, and it's all gone, right? So I get it, you feel terrible for them and they did not expect to have this problem. And so I remember asking, I was like, hey, okay, well, what do you think is the appropriate price we should sell this for? I said, I'll do the manager override for you. And I was like, I'll deal with whatever heat I have to get. I'll, I'll do the override for you. So the next person that comes in for data backup solution, you sell it at whatever you think is the appropriate price. Hmm. And so he said, well, I think it's just a half hour labor because really all it takes us is, you know, we just got to push the button and check and make sure that everything copied without errors. I said, okay, fine. So we'll sell it with 29 bucks. Yeah, I think it'd be great. I think it'd be awesome. So I went and uh, he sold the next one and they started balking at the $29 because he's selling the price. He was selling them the price. He sold them. It's only half hour of work. Like, oh, well, it's only half hour work. Can't you just do it right now? They wanted to go for free. Yeah. And so we'd made a bet on it. So I got lunch out of the deal. <laughs> and, uh, interesting, but yeah, yeah. It, it is. It's, it's really like, what is it you're doing to make their life easier? That's the value. It's not the time that it takes you. It's not any of that. It's really, what are you doing to make their life easier? But understanding how you relate to those folks, you were talking about the guides. Like that was one of the pieces I uh, mm -hmm. marked on here. So let's mm -hmm. see, where was that? Chapter eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm is you know use the example of uh, like you know harry potter and hogwarts and all this stuff uh -huh. but i mean it, it's true you know because i've been reading from proverbs i went straight to you know proverbs fifteen twenty one. you know plans fail for a lack of counsel though with many advisors they succeed yes. and it's 
really, really critical to get the right folks on board to help advise you. Yes. So, yes. Love that. I love that. And I think that people like part of why I like the tools in the second half of the book, like writing a customer focused value proposition and thinking through the topic map for qualifying. The reason I put those things in there is because nobody, when you explain the hero guide metaphor, nobody who loves people is going to say, I think it's all about me and that I really want to be the hero. I mean, right. nobody really is going to say that unless they're a narcissist, right. right? The problem is that in practice, we have bad habits where we don't act like that's true. So we make the first sentence always be about ourselves, mm -hmm. or we have the whole website about how our grandfather started the company 60 years ago. And it's all about the history of our company. And I think there are a lot of social media consultants. There's still a lot of people out there who I think they're giving people bad advice by saying, tell your story as the founder. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be very small. That's why I like mm -hmm. with the hero guide image. I like the idea. Of, and I like to say, you are not going to ever be up for best actor, but you could win best supporting actor. <laughs> right. And if you love people and you're in this to serve people, then you should rejoice when the, your, your client is up for best actor and that they experience their best life, whatever that looks like, hopefully with your product or service. So we will, one of the first things we do when we bring on a new client is say pitch to us, how you would pitch to a client. I like it. And nine times out of 10, it is what you just said, all about them, yep. why they're the best company, feature, why they're the greatest people. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, instead of saying, hey, here's what the problem is, you know, here's the challenge that yeah. the industry is facing. You might be facing it too. And if so, we have a solution. And this right. is getting to that really fast. It, it completely takes the air of my sales when I'm sitting at a, a sales call mm -hmm. and, the, and the guy, the presenter just talks about them for 45 yeah. straight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, all the information is on the website now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, I don't need to tell you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now it's still it's 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 hard to get on the habit though. Well, one thing I want to mm -hmm. ask you about because you talk about um, inexperienced salespeople over prepare, mm -hmm. and I am a notorious over preparer. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can talk about just so we know, here are uh, Steve's <laughs> notes. We're ready. For, uh, we got great notes. <laughs> our, so can you can you today. talk a little about like why that's not ideal and what mm -hmm. I can do to stop doing that so much? <laughs> sure, sure. Well. <laughs> I think that, so may I ask you this, would you concur that, that a lot of times that's coming out of a place of nervousness? Absolutely. Like, I, like, for some reason, I want to know more about my client's business than the, than the client themselves. And just so that there's, so I'm not missing anything. Yes. But, and, and seem like I'm the, you know, at their level or, or above, but I don't have to be right. 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 And, and I think if you specialize in a certain industry only, I mean, I could see that that would be more nerve wracking, right? Because you want to have a lot of industry depth as well as you know, consulting differentiation to offer. Um, I have a great example of this and I, and I promise I'll answer your question. I had a lead with um, somebody that I went to high school with. They they actually saw the book on Facebook <laughs> and they're in an industry, Casey sees, I won't name who it is, but um, <laughs> it, he he's in an industry I really hardly ever worked in. And I just can't believe it because I feel like I've sold products and services to almost everything, but there's some terminology and things that I just didn't know. And so I did a little bit of reading ahead of time, but I came into the call pretty quickly saying, I'm I mean, the good news is he said, I read the book and I think you could help my people. So that was good. So it was a warm lead. But I said, I'm going to need some training on some of the terms here. Like I was just very transparent yeah. about that because there's no way in a short time, let's say I spent three hours preparing, that wouldn't be able to compare to his 25 year career in the right. industry. Yeah. Right? right. So, um, so one thing that might be helpful, Steve, I appreciate your question. Sometimes I think, what if you plan the amount of time you spend researching to be commensurate with whatever the task is going to be, right? So if you, what that would look like is if there's a really good chance, if you're going to just send an email, you don't have to do, they're not writing back right away. So you don't have to do that much research. <laughs> you just want to say, use the right words. If you are leaving a message, you're prospecting, you're a business development rep and you're prospecting, super low probability you're going to get the person. You're probably going to elect to leave a voicemail or not. You have to have a little bit more information than you did to write an email. If you're actually going to have the call, I I never wing it. I mean, I have questions I'm going to ask prepared before I get on, yeah. but I find I need like four questions. Really, that's really okay. all I have. I don't need 40 because if the goal, I think I share in the book, if the goal is the 70-30 equation, 
them talking 70% of the time and me talking 30, then if I have a lot more questions than that, and I feel really determined about getting through them, then I'm at risk of not listening. Yeah. So, um, it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. uh, one of the elders at, a our church or church we used to go to, at least he, uh, said, God gave you two ears and one mouth, use them in the same proportion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And people, people hear that, but again, bad habits, uh -huh. bad habits. Yeah. Um, where else do you feel like that challenge comes up? Does that, is that answer helpful or anything else come well, to mind about the researching? Cause I think the more technical it is that some, something someone sells, the more this is a temptation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am a lifelong learner. I love learning stuff anyway, but you can spend an inordinate an amount of time just researching. And yeah. I did take what you said on, on point that you don't just wing it. Like you have a script It's important to prepare, yeah. but this idea of just over preparing, um, will detract from what I'm really trying to achieve by getting that person to really talk about their challenges. Yes. So right. yes. that was, I'm glad you mentioned that in the yeah. book. It Thank was really you. helpful. Thank you. Don't you think too, since you all are, are owners who sell also, which I am as well, I think too that we can have actually a quite modest goal about the number of revenue generating activities you do in any given day. And it's more like a marathon analogy. Mm -hmm. It's like, if I do these things every day, then I'm going to have a full pipeline. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not going to feel scared if something doesn't close because I have other things in the wings. If you are a full-time salesperson, you need to do more activities a day. But even that, I think it's really about consistency as opposed <laughs> to up and down and flurries of activities. And again, that gets to so much of selling is self-management. Mm -hmm instead of yeah. other people management. Well, I've talked about this before with Steve several times is, you know, being the owner and being the primary salesperson, and I'm trying very hard to get other, you know, folks engaged properly, but is we would have a great sales month and then we'd spend all the time doing the work. Then yes. I have another sales month, yes. we'd have all the time doing the work. And it's like, how do you get the appropriate balance of, of activities there? Yes, yes. So I've got a question for you here is, you know, we, we've talked about selling like the, the, you know, years long relationships and the good this does and working with folks. But what about uh, a small business bringing in a new salesman? You know, maybe it's an experienced person, maybe someone from different industry, but they don't have those decades long relationships. What hope do these folks have? How would you advise getting that that first, you know, sales guide started? Mm -hmm. So there are some tools that would just be true for any industry. If you're business to business, I'll just rattle them off. Sure. So do you have a few versions of your value proposition? When okay. I say a few versions, what I mean is, um, I think it's uh, either chapter six or seven. I'll have to look it up. Chapter six or seven. It's that customer focused value proposition that starts with problem solution. So the first sentence is about the person you want to serve. Second sentence is how you do it. You don't have only one of those. Right. Depending on the, the title, the role of the person you're selling to, the industry you're selling to, you, have, you can have many versions of those. So do you have at least a handful that are already vetted that you can give the person? And that's part of their training. This okay. is the benefit we offer. So, right, so they need some value propositions. And then they can pick and choose depending on where What's the hierarchy they're talking exactly. to. Exactly. And also use them. Like you put, I put them in my email. That's why I wrote that kind of um, generic sales template that mm -hmm. is in the book that says, this is how you would insert a value proposition inside a solicitation email. Because I really do write that way. I just rewrote some copy for a video and they asked me specifically to list some things about what was unique about extra bold sales. And I was writing and then I went back and proofed it. And I thought, you know better than this. You have the customer focused value proposition. And I literally flipped it and I changed it so that I started out with the challenge that many people would have yeah. if they came to me, right? You need to open with those things. So you have value propositions. You've got to have a sense of who you're selling to. You want to have a basic way of tracking what you're doing. Um, but another thing I'm going to suggest too, is that I think it took me like 10 years to figure this out. So if anyone can benefit from this sooner, I hope they will. I think when you're new to the role, you can use that to your advantage just by being a nice person, <laughs> mm -hmm. just, just, just by asking for help, yeah. by being a good, just by being a good human who is interested in the person that you're selling to builds a real relationship with them. And I say, I'm not proud of this, but the first few years I sold, if you were to go look at my LinkedIn 
profile and in my and my connections, you won't see some of my early customers in there because those relationships were very transactional. Right. And I actually I didn't I didn't ever learn I didn't ever know their birthday or the name of their kids or ask where they went on vacation or understand anything that was important to them. And since what I sold to them was worth a million dollars, literally, we had enough time together that I could have known <laughs> those things. Yeah. Right. But I didn't ask. And yeah. part of it was like, I felt as a young salesperson, I felt so much lower in status that I didn't think I could. Right. And that's not true. That's just not true. People are just people. And so what happened is, they bought from me, but it was very transactional and we actually weren't friends. And I think you can play the friends card. And I don't mean that in an insincere way at all. It has to be sincere, but I think you can just be a nice person mm -hmm. and play the friends card as you build up your real network right. for referrals. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think it, it's, there's a lot of truth to that because again, like I say, there's so much information available. Like take the world we're in with quality management, consulting and software. We're by no means the only folks in the space. Mm -hmm. by, by no means. Now, there's things we do better than the other folks. There are things others do better than us. But really, that differenti differentiator these days, I, I really think, boils down to how well you can personally relate to someone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talking about when I started the business, I think Steve, you, you know, kind of feel the same way here. You're talking about getting in consulting, the same reason is I felt like doing the work, you know, me being the hands on person, which is where I could add the most value but I'm really finding it's a little bit different now is if they get sold the wrong product or they get sold the wrong service and the wrong, uh, with the wrong idea of goals that they're going to achieve at the end, it doesn't mean a darn thing how good I do at the work. Mm -hmm. We started out with the wrong goal. Mm -hmm. We started out in the wrong direction. I cannot work hard enough to satisfy these folks. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does boil down that relationship because you're not going to understand truly understand where they're going bonkers in their business unless you can treat them like a person. That's right. Unless you can approach them as a friend of, hey, what's what's really bugging you today? What's what's eating at you? Well, how about anyone who sells any kind of services? They always have scope creep. Oh, yeah. You always have things evolve. And the only way that's okay and that you can go off contract or modify a contract without there being hard feelings is that they feel like you're really for them. Yes. Right. And, and so that we can say, so I made my very best guess about how long this would take based on what you've told me. But since then, here's what we've learned and here's what's happened for them to say, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Let's, let's if, adjust that and have it be OK. If, if, if they don't if they're not giving you that concession, it's probably indicative either of them and their personality mm -hmm. or probably more likely lack of real relationship. Uh, absolutely. We've had a couple of uh, contracts where it has, there's been a lot of scope creep in it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the language was not exactly right on those initial proposals, but we didn't have that relationship so that I could come back and say, you know, look, we're really going way out on a limb here. Here's everything that we're doing here. We really need to pause and reevaluate. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to do a separate SOW, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that without that relationship because they have to go back to their boss to get the approvals and all of it. And there's just say, no, no, it says here on uh, clause three, letter A, that this is what we do. So if you have to work a thousand hours to do it, you need to work a thousand hours to do that's it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Don't you think, too, Kyle, to go back to the book, don't you think that's because it, with the Venn diagram with the MVP list, something was off? Mm -hmm. Like when I hear that, I think those of you that have the book, I'm looking at page, um, I think it's page 34, let me see, page 33, comfort status security. Oh, yeah. Now your mess up, which they perceive as your mess up, right? Mm -hmm. Your mess up threatens them. Oh, yeah. I feel uncomfortable. Yes. I feel internally terrified about my own status. And you, you were making me feel secure, but now I don't feel secure. And so um, I'm going to throw you under the bus. It starts to feel like going to a, a sleazy auto mechanic. Mm -hmm. You never know how many extra things you're going to find. Right. I think we've all had that. Like mm -hmm. you go in to get one thing done. It's going to cost like three or four hundred bucks, whatever it is. Oh, well, we found this. Well, how much is going to be? Oh, that's six hundred dollars. Fine. It needs done. They call you the next day. Hey, while we were in there, we found this. Like, when's it going to end? Yes. And you want to know that there is an end. You want yes. to have trust that they have really done their homework before they called you to ask for more money. That's right. So whether we're their buyer or the seller, I think those three mm -hmm. issues of comfort, security, and status, they come up over and over again because we're always asking, is this person really for me? Do they understand my goals? 
are they helping me where I'm trying to go? Or are they actually, they don't mean to be, but either from ignorance or malice, they're not for me. Yeah. They're a threat to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you can address those needs, the, the whole, pro, then you, that process is, is way streamlined. Yeah. We, we focus a lot on just the technical yeah. part of things. You might think about the exec, how we execute that job, mm -hmm. but we don't really think about how to communicate, how to translate mm -hmm. that need into how they're really feeling, what their needs are yeah. as a person. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why this is a, this is why you wrote the book, how good humans sell. Mm -hmm. Good humans want to help people yeah. understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is one of the favorite things I say in a, any consultation work, any training you would do is like, you have to treat people like people. That's right. Like we get so caught up and they say all the technicals and you know, the world where we've got all these standards and specifications like, well, at the end of the day, it's going to be someone who dropped their kid off that morning for school who was crying because the sock they wanted was dirty or lost. And now you're asking them to come to work and handle all these other issues. That's like right. they're people. That's right. You got to treat them like people and recognize that they are not much different than you. You know, I, a few weeks ago, our dog died and it was terrible because she really was my dog. Like, I mean, they, like <laughs> she's the family dog, but I spent the most time with her. So she was my dog and she died right in front of me. And it was totally unexpected. Ooh. It was terrible. I had multiple clients who called me. They didn't even email. Like I could see them coming up on my phone and they called me when they saw me make a comment about it. And people were just coming out of the woodwork saying, yeah. oh, my heart is breaking for you. We love our Lucy. We love our so-and-so. Right. We're just dreading when this day comes. So I'm just thinking so much about you. And I was so surprised who called. Like I was mm. so surprised because yeah. we connected on a human level on other things, but I, we had never talked about being a dog person. Right. It was so sweet. Yeah. I mean, it was so, and I will remember, I remember sticking them off in my mind. I remember exactly who that was Yeah. and just so unexpected, but that's like a good human sort of thing to do. That's, that's such a testament to that. You are making a huge impact on people's lives. Yeah. I guess they yeah. called about, they called about my dog. Yeah. You know? no, I mean, it is it really it is amazing. It's like the further I go down this road, the more and more I realize that, you know, truly that the sales process is, I say process because it's the world I live in is process. Sure, sure. It really is so incredibly critical. I mean, mm -hmm. we can set up so many things for failure at the beginning and it does not matter how many good people we have on the back end. Mm -hmm. If those goals were not lined up properly, if that relationship with the person isn't lined up properly for when things go bump in the night, two weeks, two months later, we're in for a world of hurt. All of us, the client, the, the contractor, mm -hmm. whoever it is, everyone's going to be struggling in the process. Mm -hmm. I think too, don't you think Steve with just with artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, like I just think that the need for people to be people, it's like we have to be uber people because why are we needed otherwise? <laughs> yeah. No, I In agree. sales enablement, there's so much amazing technology out there. I mean, I just, I can hardly keep up and I read about it all the time. There's so much cool stuff that's being developed. Why do they need people? I think that'd be a great uh, book number two for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we are probably about out of time here. You got any final comments or questions, Steve? Uh, Thank you for writing this book. Like I said, there's a lot about the sales process and it's important to have that. But if you don't get all that brain trash right, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. then it's, it's really all for not. So no, I you. agree. Thank I agree. You. It was very good. Very Thanks. much appreciate it. Thank so you. where can they find out more about you? Where can they purchase the book? Give thank us those you. details. Sure. Thank you. So the book is on Amazon. I, it's available on um, paperback and Kindle right now. And it will be available on Audible at the new year. So I plan All to, right. I know you're a big Audible listener, so I, I, that, I, that's my Q4 project is to get that on Audible. So it will be available in January on Audible. And you can learn everything about me at my company website, which is extra bold, E-X-T-R-A-B-O-L-D sales.com. Cool. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.